Hey y'all, it's Heather. Before the episode starts, we want to address the audio. We had a software glitch on Christy's side, so her audio sounds a bit different than usual. We hope it won't diminish the importance of this case. Thanks so much for listening. With seven victims already found dead, the local police tried to appease families by creating a task force. But another body was found. Soon it would become apparent that the corruption plaguing the community for decades was powerful enough to infiltrate the task force, too. Years passed, suspects' names were whispered by neighbors, but no arrests were made. Will these women ever find justice? This week's episode is The Unsolved Murders of the Jeff Davis Eight, Part 2. Up uh, in the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinister who? list of things going wrong in this town keeps adding up and up the more we dig into this the more you learn about some of these players i told you earlier i don't know that there's uh there are a few people we have covered that disgust me more than terry gillery he's a gross gross human being Mm -hmm. uh just overall still uh spoiler alert still a law enforcement officer so just put that in your put that in the back of your head as you hear all the things we're about to reveal i sat through a couple of educational seminars on wrongful conviction day the innocence project did a whole day of programming where you could just tune in i think you can watch the replays too if you go to the innocence network website one of them was these data analysts that are working on a system they worked a little bit in chicago and then they've uh, applied it to the state of louisiana where it's a law enforcement agent database so you can see in this case where some law enforcement agencies sort of trade people around like trade Mm -hmm. bad actors around and this database is meant to be publicly accessible and available to residents citizens voters as well as if you are a victim of uh, police misconduct wrongful conviction to look this up and see this pattern in practice not just by police department but then by individual actor it's still in its works it's called lead l-l-e-a-d um, I think it's lead.co, if I'm not mistaken. But it was very fascinating that this is a prevalent issue yeah. where you have somebody with, like, doing bad bad acts and then just move into a different jurisdiction. It's like how we talked about on our recent true crime headlines on Patreon with doctors, that mm-hmm. if doctors are doing illegal things in one city and then they just, like, move towns and become a doctor, like... How would you know about that if not for it being made publicly available? Yeah, exactly. It's some sort of searchable database. So you, you something as important as a lawyer, a doctor, a uh, law enforcement official. I mean, I have my stuff's reported. Like the state bar, you can look it up and say like eligible to practice, not eligible to practice. This We can see all the lascivious things you've been up to on that dirty. website. <laughs> I told you the other day when we were driving and I was like, uh, hollering, uh, obscenities at a person who was blocking the road. I was in the car. I, I remember it well. And I said, you know what? Everything I do, I go, I like to live my life that if later on the news came up and goes, Heather McKinney, did you do this? I go, hell yes, I did that. <laughs> um, because those people were in the way they were being, uh, entitled. <laughs> they should have moved. They were but in yeah, the way. I think it's, it should be public. It should be searchable. It should be. Uh, and back then it was not. And now it's still, just carrying a gun and charge small stuff. town police force small town politics especially in the south it seems can be very very corrupt to the point where if you live in that town and you are literally on the wrong side of the tracks like Jennings is divided you're kind of screwed like what yeah. do you do unless you have the means to get out which most of the people there do not, then you are kind of a victim of your own environment and you're, you have no choice but to adapt the best way you can because it just becomes survival mode. Absolutely. I think you were spot on last episode when you brought up the Murdoch case Mm. because 
it, it has a lot of similarities of sort of entrenched power. Now, this is less wealthy, although we'll see there was some money change in hands because you have what's what's worth more than money piles of cocaine and meth and crack and everything and so when there's a reason to try to keep hang on to power and then people that are unchallenged there's like no oversight you don't really have federal investigators coming in you may have the fbi on this task force but we need like a full department of justice kick the door in and go we're going to go through all this because you can't continue to abuse inmates you can't continue to abuse you know citizens of your town with impunity until that happens you're right they're power i mean it's you're just trying to do what you can to survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, becomes very cyclical too. And it makes me wonder how many other small towns like this are suffering in the same way. Yeah, that just so happened didn't get on the map or Mm -hmm. the, you know, if there are people being murdered, it's in such a way that it doesn't seem, you know, serial. I think the initial interest in this was because people thought, oh, it's a serial killer. Mm -hmm. And when you say, oh, it's something that's way more common and uh, almost more horrifying because it is so everyday commonplace, the banality of evil of just this is just a thing that happens in many, many towns all over and nothing's being done to stop it. No. Um, it might get your attention on the fr- front end, but that might that attention might not be in these other small towns, mm-hmm. like you said. Yeah. Well, we're going to get into the rest of the Jeff Davis eight and. Good God, is there a lot of corruption in this town and everyone seems to be literally and figuratively in bed together. People that yeah. should not be in bed together yeah. for more reasons than one. Minors, Agreed. related, uh, conflict of interest, power imbalance. It's just all over the place. Absolutely. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. With seven residents killed under mysterious circumstances in such a short amount of time, law enforcement officials in Jennings, Louisiana, felt the pressure to find the perpetrator and put a stop to the violence. In December 2008, Sheriff Ricky Edwards held a press conference announcing a new multi-agency task force funded with external resources, including $250,000 to the department to hire new personnel. The sheriff promised to make headway in the case. Family members of the victims confronted Sheriff Edwards at the task force press conference, questioning why he hadn't taken the case more seriously before that day. It was also during this time that Sheriff Edwards increased the reward for information on the killer, finally confirming the belief that the authorities thought one person was responsible for murdering the women, meaning a serial killer was at large in Jennings. What gets me about uh, Sheriff Ricky Edwards is that it's it appears to me, based upon his actions, my inference is that he's a... He likes to take advantage of situations, and this is a way to get more money for the department, the way to hire your buddies. So takes that into consideration or takes, you know, that uh, – the option's there. If the FBI is like, we'll give you some money to fund this, Mm -hmm. you would take it. And then on the second part of this push in the serial killer narrative, it really takes the pressure off. Yeah, it takes um, the pressure off the department. You look like you're really trying to actively help these women. Let's just, we'll brush it under the rug that seven people have already died before this was decided to even be formed. But Sheriff Ricky Edwards can't stand him. He is a smug piece of shit. Every interview they have of him, he's just unapologetic in his, uh, I don't want to say, because a, a sheriff should be, you know, supportive of the department, but un- unapologetic in like refusal to admit that they fucked up at any step along the way or that things that Dateline NBC comes to town and covers. And he's like, yeah, well, that's just how things go. He's just, you can tell he's a big man on campus in this town. And that translates to every walk of life with him. He, he has no humility. He thinks he's the most important person in the room and that he's untouchable. And he bristles at any mm-hmm. possibility that of any wrongdoing. Any, and I really respect any boss, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's a DA's office, that says, I will root out corruption wherever it's at. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm here. We're here to protect and serve. We're not here to be ultimate authorities and arbiters. I have full respect for that. He ain't that. No. no. He's like, leave us alone. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of our own. Fuck off. And then you find We're not doing anything wrong. Everything we're doing is above board. Yeah. 
and there's no need to question it. And he just like shuts it down and they'll hold the camera on his face after he stops talking. And he's just like, it's like a staring contest. Like, I'm not even going to lose this. You're going to blink first. He's just, everything is a competition is the vibe Mm -hmm. I get with him. One of the new hires on the task force was Paula Guillory, whose husband at the time, Terry Guillory, also worked for the department. Paula was put in charge of the evidence room and told reporter Ethan Brown that it was her husband who got her into law enforcement. Terry Guillory was well known around Jennings and the nearby towns. He worked his way up through the ranks starting in 1988 as a jailer. By 2005, he was the warden of the jail, having also served as a patrol officer and other roles in the department. It's like one of those where they recognized him in town rolling around in his patrol car. Oh, like yeah. you knew that was Terry Guillory. And a lot of these women, in fact, all of these women, knew him. He knew them. They had interactions with him. Some of them were significantly younger than him, so he knew them as kids. He almost had a hand in, like, raising them. His mom had a hand in raising them. This is the type of town where, from all the interviews with the residents and even law enforcement, everybody kind of helped everyone raise their kids and was almost family because it was so tight-knit and such a small community. But also, drug use was so rampant that there was so many people struggling with addiction that kids kind of floated from house to house and whoever was able to take care of somebody at that time kind of stepped in to do it. So, so many of the residents are like, oh yeah, that was my aunt or that was my uncle. Those are, you know, not by blood or my bearish. That's just how they grew up knowing them because they stepped in in this family role. Well, when you have a cop stepping in as that, most people would think, oh, it's a cop. We can trust him. We've known him all his life. He's been around forever. Surely Terry does no wrong. And in the beginning, people knew him as, you need something? Call Terry. He'll help you out. He's he's a good guy. I think with great power comes great responsibility, and he did not take that responsibility. Instead, he used it as an opportunity to manipulate people, use his power to control people, and very gross and harmful ways and illegal. Oh yeah. And the flip side of saying call Terry, if you've got a problem is he, you now owe him a favor. Yes, exactly. He'll do you, he'll help you out, Mm -hmm. but it comes at a cost no matter who you are or how old you are. Mm -hmm. People in town knew Terry, according to several residents interviewed on the docuseries murder in the Bayou. He had sexual relations with several of the victims, including Loretta Shashan, the first victim just weeks before her murder. One of Loretta's friends, Roxanne, who provided a safe place for down-on-their-luck women to stay, told filmmakers that Loretta knew things about Terry that no one else did. Well, kind of like what you said about kids being taken care of, this seems like Roxanne has a place where women knew, she said they knew that they could sleep, that no one was going to attack them in their sleep. Mm -hmm. They knew if they needed medical help, we would figure out where to get them. They knew if they needed money, we could try to, you know, and she had, you know, it was this landing spot. It was an open door policy. Yeah. She said Mm -hmm. they'd stay for a couple days, you know, and that's very common with victims of abuse and those struggling with substance abuse. They have a place for respite for a few days and Mm -hmm. then they go out and hustle for a few more days and then they would come back to her house for a few days. So she knew all of these girls and knew them in a way that a lot of others didn't because they knew that they could trust her and talk to her mm-hmm. and let their guard down. So she knew that Terry had was having an affair with Loretta. Well, even if you're the warden of the jail sleeping with a often inmate, if you sleep together long enough, things start coming out in pillow talk and other, you know, or you just overhear stuff. Like, you're going to know stuff. So on one hand, you're sleeping with the warden. You get some perks. Maybe you get let out of jail early. On the flip side, you know a lot about him, and that makes you a liability, and therefore you're automatically in danger. Yes, and they said he would give her a ride home in his patrol car, Mm -hmm. which for a person who might have to interact with people selling drugs or people on the wrong side of the law was not a great look. And they said he just was real open about it. Just like, oh, get out of the car. Here you go. I'm dropping you off. Which, And it wasn't her mother that said, or maybe it was a relative that said, I've been to jail plenty Mm -hmm. of times and the warden's never given me a ride home in his car. Yeah. But he did that for Loretta. Mm -hmm. Before her murder, 
Loretta indicated to her brother she had been working with police as an informant, saying she traded information about a drug dealer in order to get out of jail early. Just two weeks later, she was dead. Loretta's brother also related stories about how Terry Guillory would pick the siblings up in his patrol car when they were young teens and take them back to his house. There, Terry would have sex with then 14-year-old Loretta while her brother stayed downstairs and waited. Horrifying. Yeah. And friends of Loretta said her whole life she thought all she was really good for was sex and giving men what they wanted. And when you see this pattern of at 14, she is being forced to have sex with a much older man that's in a position of power. Uh, I mean, we can all pretty probably assume it didn't start at 14. Mm -hmm. So when you grow up and like you're sexually abused and you're exposed to all of these things, you shouldn't, no one can look at her situation and say like, how did how did we not get here? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. obviously she's going to feel this way. No one has stepped in to help her at any, any time in her life. She didn't have the adults in her life to, to guide her and provide, like, a safe place. Yeah, and you're repeat. you think, as a little kid, you know, you get taught in school, if you need help, go to a policeman, mm-hmm. yet you're being repeatedly raped by that same yeah. policeman, then you know, well, he'll be nice to me if I have sex with mm-hmm. him. And then that translated to one of her cellmates said, oh, when she was in jail, I looked over, I heard some sounds, and I looked over, and Terry Guillory was having sex with Loretta through the bars mm-hmm. while he was on duty. I mean, oh, he's yeah. like... I mean, it's just blatant, rampant sexual abuse of these inmates. Yeah. And it was not just Loretta, but like you said, it started early. And when you have that pain of the re- being repeatedly sexually abused by a person in authority, uh, you can't say no. You know, not to mention you're a kid, but on top of that, he's got a gun. Yeah. He is the cops. He is the law. We're going to call 911. One of your buddies is over here. Mm-hmm. And so you've got to do something to numb that pain. And so, you know, we, we got a lot of comments about the last episode about, you know, humanizing people and saying folks are more than their substance mm-hmm. use issues. And if there was ever, a, you know, a uh, it doesn't. It's not a reason to. I'm not telling you to do it. But if you go, man, I wonder why she turned to that. Mm-hmm. I think that that's probably a big part of it. Mm-hmm. And the whole town of Jennings, because of the location of what we talked in the last episode, it's smack dab in the middle. If you're driving down I-10 from Houston, New Orleans, and there's the drug trade on that interstate is just wild, and it's all coming together in Jennings. Well, the cops bust people. Well, but the cops are in bed with the drug dealers, so then the drugs go right back out on the street. So nobody's doing anything to help these people that are struggling. In fact, they're doing things to uh, perpetuate the situation and, and make it even worse. And if you think we know it at least 14, Terry Guillory is having sex with her. She was in her uh, early 20s when she, when she was killed, so... For probably a decade or more, he was sexually abusing her. That's Yeah, that's what her brother said, at Mm -hmm. least on Murder in the Bayou. Yeah. Just after her body was discovered, Terry had also come to Crystal Benoit Zeno's family to inform them that she was the victim. He based his identification on some tattoos in places it would be hidden when Crystal was clothed. It was well known that the other women of the Jeff Davis 8 had also worked with Terry Guillory as informants. Yeah, that was suspicious to her family, mm-hmm. not to mention the decomposition level of her of Crystal's body. He wouldn't have been able to see that, but that was his excuse because he knew it was her. He knew she was found before the medical examiner could identify her and told her family, it's her because, you know, she's got that tattoo kind of like down lower on her back. And they're like, you don't see that unless her pants are off. Mm-hmm. And the way her body was found, it was so decomposed that that tattoo wouldn't have been visible. Mm-hmm. Crystal's cousin in murder in the bayou says she was a babysitter for Terry and that that relationship extended past just babysitter and that he also was having a sexual relationship with her. Well, that's probably how he knew about this tattoo. Mm -hmm. It would stand to reason. He knew that she was dead before it was made public. And um, one might ask the question, well, how, how did he know that? That's a great question. And and you use the phrase, Crystal's dead, but I didn't kill her. Yes. Unprompted, too. Unprompted. No one, none of the family said, well, did you do it? Or do you know who did it? It was just, Crystal said, I didn't kill her. Well, nobody said you did, Sheriff, or nobody said you did. Terry, why are you 
bringing that up. Guilty? Yeah. You feel yeah. some guilt? Ethan Brown's initial piece, Who Killed the Jeff Davis 8? Detailed questioning of an inmate who had knowledge of a truck that was used to dispose of Kristen Lopez's body. In March of 2007, Warren Gary, then an employee at the Sheriff's Department, bought that same truck from an inmate at the jail. Another inmate who had knowledge of the transaction confirmed that Warren Gary knew about Kristen's murder and knew that her DNA was left in the truck when he agreed to purchase and wash it. Frankie's niece, Hannah Connor, was quoted as saying Warren Gary and Frankie Richard are good friends that Warren brought the truck so that the evidence wouldn't come back to Uncle Frankie. Warren Gary discarded it. He cleaned that truck at the car wash. The car wash used to destroy the DNA evidence, according to Brown, was directly across the street from the multi-agency task force. As punishment, Gary was fined $10,000 by the Louisiana Board of Ethics in June of 2008. Yeah, I mean, they tried to play it as, well, he worked in the jail and she mentioned she needed to sell this truck. And so he bought it from her for like eight grand and then cleaned it up real good. And he turned and sold it for 15 grand. And there's, you know, aside from it being an inmate, there's really no problem. He was trying to help her out Mm -hmm. and make a little bit of money. Hell no, this man Mm -mm. was not a car dealer. (laughs) He was absolutely not a car dealer. And the woman that sold it to him was also a known person that worked with Frankie Richard. Yes. So people talk in that tiny jail and he's like oh we need you need some help frankie needs some help all right i'm gonna buy this truck from you i'm gonna don't worry about it i'm gonna dispose of all the evidence and then again when sheriff ricky edwards is questioned about this he's like i don't see a problem with it just seems like two people doing a transaction are you fucking kidding this is an inmate at the jail i'm not saying that they shouldn't have the right to go sell a truck but it's a conflict of interest if a employee at that same jail is doing like financial business with an inmate well and especially because it's not like he said okay i bought it for eight thousand dollars and then sold it for 15 because i added a bunch of stuff to it i mean he washed all the murder evidence out of it which i think would increase the value somewhat but it would not 50 percent right and and like you said that is a conflict of interest because you're now taking advantage of a person who is in in theory it's her truck right and she's in jail and she needs to make a little bit of cash and you buy it at a cut rate Mm -hmm. because of the circumstance that's not fair market value or an arm's length transaction and so yeah he gets you know this little slap on the wrist by the louisiana board of ethics and just keeps on working for the sheriff's department and that's the thing we'll see time and time again is they do these little slaps on the wrist like okay well we'll fine you ten thousand dollars because it It makes us look like we're doing something about it. But you still get to keep your job. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, nothing was really done. It's all just superficial. So people think that, you know, they're not just completely absolving themselves of something. Well, and it's crazy to me that they didn't even say, okay, well, now that this happened, what we can do is try to go back and grab the truck and and dig down. You know, he couldn't have gotten it all. Maybe there's a fingernail or a hair or something in the truck that can prove she was in it because she was found in March of 2008. And it was that same month, or 2007. It was that same month Mm -hmm. that the truck was sold. And so, or maybe it was in June. So it was, you know, a couple months. But it's like, at least go and look, you know, sniff it around. You tell the new owner, hey, you know, I get it that you bought this truck. We're going to just need to impound it and go through it. Obviously, we're going to, exa- you know, rule you out if you had nothing to do with it. But this is equivalent to er- Ernestine's case where they just left the blood on the porch mm-hmm. and just were like, well, it washed away. Isn't that crazy? It's like, yeah, because you waited 18 15 months. months. Yeah, I think it was 18 even. Yeah. The um, when one of the investigators was questioned about this whole truck thing, too, they said, well, you know, it happens. People, and, and sometimes you go back and find evidence. So it's not like they wouldn't have found evidence even though it had been washed. Well, perhaps. But I bet yeah. the likelihood of finding that evidence would be much greater had it not had a deep clean. Mm-hmm. Vacuuming it out and pouring bleach in mm-hmm. it or whatever. Sinisterhood will be right back. Well... I talked to my fashionable pal Megan today, and she told me that lavender is the new neutral for the fall. And so I got myself a pair of Desert Rose Rothy driver shoes because that's a hip style. I'm getting hip. <laughs> so you didn't go lavender. You went Desert I, Rose. Well, that was close. It's a it's a purpley pink. So okay. it's on it's in the shoes. Gotcha. Well, 
if you want to be hip like Heather, and I'm still deciding on what color I, I was going to, I was thinking I was going to order black, but if lavender's the new black, then maybe I go lavender. I don't, uh, Megan said, we don't know why, but this is what we're hearing. And I who love, is she's we, in California. And who is, who is hearing? California. She hears, she's hip. She's San got Francisco. her finger on the pulse. She's in San Francisco. She's got her finger on the pulse. Well, I'm excited though, because all my drivers are coming and I'm ready to drive in them. Nice. And night in, in the fall, night falls sooner. Costume parties are filling your calendar and I'm ready to rock and go as a, my Halloween costume this year is going to be fashionable gal in my new Rothy's. Oh, I'm going as comfortable Christy. <laughs> so I will also be wearing some. And transitioning to fall is easy with Rossi shoes with so many colors that work season after season. It would be a crime not to have a pair. From the unbeatable comfort to the fact that you can wash them. Shout out Stinky Feet Gang. What <laughs> else do you need to know that Rothy shoes check every box? Yeah, definitely washing those and they still look great after you washing them. That is a game changer. They don't look like they're worn afterwards. They look like they're the day you got them still afterwards. Fresh. Yeah, but you, you fell feel so much uh, more confident knowing my shoes don't stink. And I they don't look stink. good too. And I'm on trend. <laughs> get into the spirit and elevate your fall wardrobe with with Rothy's. Plus get $20 off your first purchase at rothys.com slash creepy. That's $20 off at R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash creepy. With so many confidential informants dead under suspicious circumstances, it seemed the task force would be well positioned to conduct a thorough investigation. However, when two witnesses came forward to the task force with information on Frankie Richard, they were told by the task force. Don't worry about Frankie Richard. Frankie Richard works for us. In audio recordings obtained by Murder in the Bayou, task force members interviewed Frankie Richard. As they questioned him, Richard finally seemed willing to offer substantial evidence. At that point, the task force members shut off the tape recorder. I mean, this is one of those moments when you're watching it where he's like, all right, you ready to get real? And you're like, yes. And then he goes, uh, we're going to end the interview. Click. And it stops he, recording. You, can, he, you can't. It's just the audio. So you can't yeah. see this. But in my head, because of what it said, he's he says something like, well, I guess I can tell you all one thing. And then one of the interviewers goes, you want me to turn this off? Okay, this concludes the interview with Frankie Richard. Like, he's asking him, like, you j can just imagine in your head, he's signaling, like, this is off the record, right? We don't want to. It's laughable how obvious it is. Oh, yeah. And the amount of tips that the task force got that then led directly back to them, including that Loretta had, I'm sorry, Nicole, one of the other victims, had had sex with Terry Guillory in the jail as well. Who's so that's his cousin. Yeah. And then also that several, it was task force members were made aware that Terry Guillory was having uh, relations with sex workers in the town, including some of the victims. It's just, why is he not being investigated except for he's an insider? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Frankie Richard's working with the cops. The cops are working with him. It's yeah. a, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. He's the biggest drug dealer and pimp in town they're getting a huge cut of what he's doing mm -hmm. they're all in bed together yeah that's i mean and it's from first glance you go how could no there's been no forward motion on this case in all these years and it's like oh there was plenty of tips coming in they were just being squashed mm -hmm. like whack-a-mole every time something pertinent would come in whether it's hard evidence like dna destroyed or substantiated eyewitness encounters it's turn off the tape recorder shred it don't tell anybody stuff it in a file yeah and when all those tips continue to point to the same handful of people mm -hmm. i mean there's your hands are tied as a resident or as one of the victim's families and you see it in murder in the bayou they're all just like completely wore out with the lack yeah. of concern that these people have for their loved ones like, what do you do? Your hands are tied. And then it starts getting to where people start dying off that are given tips. So then you're going to keep your mouth shut so you stay alive. Yep. Lesson learned. In 2009, when Frankie Richard and his mother were implicated in a widespread theft ring, somehow $4,000 of stolen cash recovered from his mother's house went missing from the sheriff's office evidence room. Terry's wife, Paula Guillory, was in charge of the evidence. 
She was fired as a result of this incident. She maintained to reporter Ethan Brown that she had no idea where the money went. Similarly, thousands of dollars worth of marijuana was also stolen from the evidence room. After Paula was fired from the sheriff's department, another employee was put in charge of the evidence room. His name? Warren Gary. He's handled evidence before. Was it destruction? For sure, yeah. But he's got experience, so let's promote him. Did he wash a car complete of DNA that would have linked someone to a murder? Yes. Yeah. I I have a theory. Hmm. I think Terry Guillory put his wife at the time, Paula, in that position to be able to have control over the evidence room. I think that uh, based on the facts that we've heard, that that opinion is not uh, out of the realm of possibility. Also, it comes with a salary. So at the, they're now divorced. Mm-hmm. Good for you, Paula. Good for you. Yeah. But, you know, at the time, you're, that's, you just doubled your income because your yeah. wife's now going to go work at the same place you did. And that role was created by this task force that your boss was like, yeah, I'll get a task force going. We'll get some extra mm-hmm. money. It'll be great. They're double dipping. Also... If something goes wrong and she gets let go, you can still control the narrative and the information that's getting leaked to the media because she's your wife. Yeah, yeah. She's in on it with you. Or even if you try to keep her ignorant and they're like, you know, you say, say I hired uh, Paris. I'm a sheriff and I hired Paris to work in the evidence room. And I go, hey, honey, do you want to go out for lunch? And Mm -hmm. then I could text whoever and say, just so you know, Paris is at lunch with me and will be for two hours. Yeah. Yeah. And the evidence room will be empty. Just FYI. Whatever you want to do with that information is up to you. But just letting yep. you know. Exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot of possibilities of have. It's very convenient. It at is. the very least to work with your spouse. Yes. Yes. Witnesses referenced in Murder in the Bayou saw Terry and Paula Guillory partying with Frankie Richard at his house in 2009. When asked about his relationship with Terry, Richard told interviewers. I've been knowing Terry Guillory all his life. Describing the law enforcement officer as somewhat a friend. Frankie also told interviewers that any time Terry was over, it was for police business. Paula, for her part, denies ever going to Frankie's house. This is where you see the narrative diverge, where you have people going, oh yeah, they were going, Terry Guillory was smoking crack with Frankie Richard. All the time, and so was his wife. And one woman in the interview said, I'd drive by and see her car at his house for hours. What do you have to do over there for hours if he's not working for you you're not working for him or you're not doing drugs together either yeah. way there's no good reason for you to be over there no there's some sort of, sort of connection and you're right in a small town especially in then an even smaller neighborhood like south jennings they know where your car looks like it's not oh, yeah. like you know every it, it's a silver honda like whose car could that be they know what, what car is yours and they're going to talk but but like you said when some people that are talking end up dead then you just kind of turns into a whisper gossip, not I'm going to go and report this to a task force. Because, again, it doesn't matter. It's a black hole. It's a shredder. If you have a tip for the task force, just put it in the filing cabinet, <laughs> right, which is just a throw in the trash. Well, and or they recount their statements altogether because somebody mm-hmm. gets to them. Because yeah. they do, like with Tracy Sheshon, she goes and gives a statement. All of a sudden, she recants it, and now she's being interviewed like, I don't know anything except that the cops are crooked and Frankie has nothing to do with this. And the look in her eyes is pure terror. Yeah, be, especially what were you saying? She was like, I know nothing. I saw nothing. I know nothing. I don't know. And you're like, um, okay, that's a pretty significant recant yeah. that you, you could just say, well, you know, I might not be sure, but it was like very sweaty, nervous, serious. I don't know anything. Mm-hmm. Please, please stop asking. Before the questions could even be finished by the interviewer, she's already shaking her head like, nope, nope. You know, I mean, she's she knew going into it. I will only say that I know nothing about this. Yeah, and she and that's probably because someone said that's, if you know yeah, what's good for you. For sure. Yeah. On August 19th, 2009, an eighth body was found. The FBI was in town working with the task force, but still, a perpetrator felt bold enough to throw the lifeless body of 26-year-old Nicole Guillory onto the grassy area near the Interstate Highway 10. Nicole shared the same last name as Terry Guillory because the two were cousins. Both were involved with law enforcement, though for Nicole, it was most often in the role as an inmate and sometimes whistleblower. Terry was fond of his cousin, perhaps too fond, as her mother recalled in Murder in the Bayou how he made comments about Nicole's appearance that indicated he found her sexually attractive. 
Yeah, that was a uh, hard pill to swallow hearing her mom say that. For sure. Then you find out later that others have said when Nicole was incarcerated to get out of jail early, she had sex with Terry. So to be put in the position where you feel like the only way for you to get out of jail is to have sex with your cousin, who is also the warden. Mm -hmm. What a life. Yeah. And that your cousin, the warden says, yes, that is the deal. And you should take it Mm -hmm. and we'll sit there and willingly do it. That's her boyfriend told the task force. Nicole's boyfriend told the task force. It was something like two weeks before she passed Mm -hmm. that she had had sex with her own cousin in this imbalanced power dynamic. For sure. Nicole's body was not as badly decomposed as the other victims. As such, the medical examiner determined her cause of death was asphyxiation. Like some of the other seven victims, Nicole had suspicions about her safety. She told her dad just days before her death. Papa, if anything happens to me, it was the police. When her mother, Barb, had asked Nicole what type of cake she would like for her upcoming birthday, Barb was distressed when her daughter replied, telling her mother not to worry about a cake, because... I won't see my birthday. Barb told filmmakers for Murder in the Bayou. She knew something or she saw something that she wasn't supposed to have seen. She told us it would be best if we didn't know. And that we we have seen this pattern with several of the other victims, too, that they told their loved ones in the weeks leading up, if something happens to me, it's the cops. Yes. And then the last footage we see of them is like looking around scared like they just saw somebody pull up in a car that they know this means trouble Mm -hmm. or that they were seen getting into the car with people that are trouble and known around town is Frankie Richard's hands on men or a cop Mm -hmm. or telling their families, I love you. And if anything happens to me, take care of my kid, take care of my family. And also just so you know, I saw something and I'm going to report it. And that leads you exactly to who's likely responsible. I mean, they said the last person I'm going to be speaking with will be the officials that should be taking my statement. And then they wind up in a a swamp. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That I was going to tell them all about this drug deal I saw or this murder I saw happen. And they're going to cut me a deal. What really happens is they get that information from you and then they kill you. So you're not out there ruining their sweet deal. They've got with the drug dealers and, other nefarious people around town. It is hard when you don't know the line of who you can report on and to whom you can report where you're like, Oh, I'm going to tell them what Frankie Richard is doing. And by doing that, not knowing that they're in cahoots that you've now reported on this person's colleague, boss, you know, whatever relationship they have with each other that you, you just can't navigate because there's, you know, kept uh, ignorant, you know, they're in vulnerable positions and you say, okay, well, I'm going to do what's right. I have information. So I'm going to try to be, a moral upstanding citizen and do my civic duty. And then the the punishment is, is the ultimate punishment is death. And then sometimes people wouldn't even rat them out, but they would see something Mm -hmm. with, um, I can't remember whose brother it was that was in the woods. He had been doing drugs and he came out and saw three men coming out from the area where one of the victim's bodies had been dumped. And, they knew each other from running around mm-hmm. in the same circles and stuff. He didn't go rat them out. But then a week later, somehow he gets run over by a train. Yeah. And, and they pl- you're placed like, him on a track. Someone yes. placed him on a track. Yeah. His sister's, Allegedly. his sister's theory is he was beaten to death and they placed him on the track to have him run over. The cops were like, no, it was suicide. She said that wasn't the case. And, you know, when you look at all these other things and see, well, these guys were known to work with Frankie Richard. If Frankie Richard had a hand in that girl's death, then, you know, you're trying to take out anybody that could be a witness to something they weren't supposed to see. It it makes sense. It does. Sinisterhood will be right back. Law enforcement in the Jennings area has been no stranger to controversy. In 1997, Dateline covered the Sheriff's Department misuse of civil asset forfeiture laws. Undercover reporters captured deputies from the department pulling over drivers who had not broken the law and demanding all valuables from them, alleging a crime had occurred. When the report aired, Sheriff Ricky Edwards did not apologize or back down. Instead, he blamed the media's unfair coverage of the town. 
And it was a bizarre uh, rebuttal because it was uh, on undercover camera. Like, it was footage. It wasn't like he's like, well, you're mischaracterizing the conversation. Well, we just watched this. Yeah. It's like a Wild West days where they the bandits pull over the train and just rob the train, except for instead of bandits, it's the sheriff's department. And Dateline had been getting all these tips that this was going on. They have footage of just 10 cars pulled over on the side of the highway with the sheriff's cars going through all of them. So then... They get a car. They load it up with cameras and stuff. The journalists are driving it. Within like 10 minutes of being on the highway, they're pulled over. Yeah, and it was cars that were specifically created that you couldn't go over 65 miles an hour. And right. the max speed was 65. So that way it was like impossible that they were speeding. Yeah. And they're like, well, we pulled you over for speeding. And he's like, I wasn't speeding. Yeah, we think you were anyway. So Because they have to have probable cause to pull you over. Mm-hmm. And speeding would be probable cause. But th- there was none. So no. they were just making it up. Yeah. Lying. And then when in the interview with Dateline and Sheriff Edwards, the journalist says, "You did you know that they pulled us over pretty quickly? And he said, well, you know, I'm not surprised if you were speeding, then yeah, they probably pulled you over. I mean, again, there's no, Mm -mm. it's just unblinking, unwavering. Yeah, this is what we did. You want to do something about it? It's, It's a challenge. Everything comes across as like he's challenging someone. Yeah. Well, who's going to stop me? And like we said, Louisiana, the sheriff is of the parish is elected and doesn't have anyone over him aside mm-hmm. from the voters who a lot of people are disenfranchised. Uh, yeah. For various and when reasons. you have the other side of the tracks that are wealthy as fuck and giving tons of money to his campaign and those are his biggest supporters, then he keeps getting reelected. Mm-hmm. That corruption seems to not have stopped, according to residents of the town. While the police were making major drug busts worth millions of dollars, many of those drugs ended up right back in the hands of vulnerable citizens in Jennings. Frankie Richard called Jennings the Wild Wild West and referred to the police, saying, Those motherfuckers want their cut. Whatever deal Frankie had with the police, it seemed to work for him. According to public records, he was arrested nearly 40 times. Time and again, charges against him were dismissed after a short stay in jail. Still, Richard was no fan of cops, telling interviewers, I don't trust them, I didn't like them, and I goddamn sure wasn't going to give them some of my money that I fucking work for. I don't buy it. I think he was given, I think he was getting a cut, he was given a cut to be arrested that many times, and they even ask one of the detectives in Murder in the Bayou, and he says, yep, that is a lot of times, Uh, but you know, we we're in charge of making the arrest and handed all the evidence over to the DA's office. And it's up to them if they want to press charges. So this is something that you should go talk to the DA's office about just completely pushing the blame off onto somebody else. Yeah. Take absolutely no responsibility. Mm -hmm. I wonder too, if he, he's doesn't want to give him like a cut of drug money, but maybe he'll give him a cut of some other money or information. He doesn't pay them in money, but information, information or assistance of, Hey, Mm -hmm. we got this body or Hey, we got this person. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things of value that can be exchanged beyond just money, giving somebody a percentage of your money. So that to me, Frankie Richard has got loose lips. Like we said in the last one, I mean, in this interview, interview with investigation discovery interview with local media, there's about two or three different news stations down there that did. And he'll just, he would talk to anybody. Most of the time he'd just be sitting on his porch. And so you just Mm -hmm. drive up and he'd be like, yeah, come on in. You want to talk to me? And so would just talk and talk and talk. And I think as much of a bullshitter as he kind of was, some things were like, he, he wasn't, as his daughter calls, he's not really clever enough, I think, to sh- shut the fuck up, which as a lawyer, I would just be like, please stop talking. Mm-hmm. But he slips these things out of like, oh, well, yeah, like the cops, they wanted me to pay him, dot, dot, dot. And you're like, so you did? Right. So he's like giving enough information to go, well, he's not just talking out of his ass. Like, he's like, well, that's our arrangement. I mean, you know, not that we have one. And you're like, wait, what? But at the same time, he's the only one that has managed to secure this spot. He's the ringleader and he's the only Mm -hmm. one that hasn't wound up dead yet from it. Or, you know, I mean, he's the only one that seems to be really benefiting and he's carved this little thing out for himself in this community where he's the go-to person. But at the same time, he also has loose lips. Yeah. And on the investigation discovery, he's making dinner. It's kind of a fluffy scene. He's cooking dinner for his two now adult children. And he's talking to the camera and he's like, I did some fucking bad shit in my life. I've did some crazy shit. And the kids are like, yeah, he doesn't talk about a lot of stuff he did. And so 
I mean, you don't become the kingpin of even a small, and I lose that, use that term loosely because, you know, but you don't become, you know, the head dude mm-hmm. of a criminal enterprise in a, even a small town without being ruthless, cutthroat, willing to, you know, it's not like, well, I would never hurt someone. He's like, I was a motherfucker. If you needed your money, I go break some kneecaps. I've broken mm-hmm. kneecaps in my life. Like fully admitting the past, you know, run strip clubs, running gambling rings, whatever. So Selling I feel like tons of drugs, doing a, tons of drugs. He didn't really have like a any problem with uh, breaking the law in any capacity, much less whether it's bribery or breaking somebody's kneecaps. He was like, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, it did not seem like he had a strong moral compass. Not really. With eight bodies dead, the last of which found when the FBI was in town, national media outlets took notice of the town once again. CNN covered the murders, as did the New York Times. It was the Times article that caught the attention of New Orleans-based investigative journalist Ethan Brown. In 2011, Brown began investigating the killings. As he pulled every public record possible, he noticed a pattern. Many acts and incidents occurred at the same address, that of a now-defunct motel called the Boudreaux Inn, owned by a man named Big G. Guillory, who disclaimed all knowledge of the lascivious ongoings at the motel. Despite rampant drug use and sex work on the premises, Big G denied ever having seen any illegal acts in an interview with Ethan Brown. I mean, it was a very organized motel where they said, okay, this, the drugs go on in the front, mm-hmm. in the middle room, then that's where you can you know, buy and trade for your sex workers. The sex goes on in the back rooms. There's gambling on this side. There's, I mean, it was well organized. It wasn't like, well, sometimes. It was $25 for three hours, and the manager who's interviewed says they turned it I mean, day and night, sometimes having three rooms going at a time. I mean, it was just the money was hand over fist. And residents said, you knew if you wanted uh, sex or drugs that you that you went there. And the women also knew if they needed to get some money, that they would go to the Boudreaux Inn, do some stuff, get their drugs, and then hopefully leave. Yeah. The big G took a turn on this interview with Ethan Brown, though. And also, shout out to Ethan Brown. He's it's he's much like Mandy Matney, where like if they they have taken notice of what would be an otherwise possibly forgotten story mm-hmm. and and said, wait a minute, let me. There's more to there's more to this, and really dug down to. I mean, page after page, and he just was like, it didn't say Boudreaux Inn, but it was this certain address, and mm-hmm. I was like, what is that address? And just that itch in your brain of like, thank God for investigative journalists that go. No, no, no. I'm getting to the bottom mm-hmm. of this and I'm going to lay it out. And he deserves so much credit for, for all the sure. work that he's done. Uh, but this interview is a recording of him interviewing Big G. And it's at first it's like, now, who are you? What's going on? And once he figures out like, hey, man, I got you. Like, I have all these witnesses that said what was going on there. I have all these documents. He's like, don't ever call me again. Mm-hmm. And is he somehow related to Terry Guillory? I believe so in a by marriage extended yeah. kind of way. Interestingly, Big G worked for a conservative Louisiana politician named Charles Bustani. At the time, Bustani was a congressman that had his eye on a more competitive Senate seat. Ethan Brown's book detailing the representative's connection to the motel, including that Bustani himself had partaken in some illegal activities, was published in 2014, derailing the Senate hopeful's campaign. At the time, Bustani denied all involvement fired Big G, and even filed a lawsuit against Brown and his publisher for defamation. However, just as soon as he lost the Senate race, Bustini dropped the defamation suit and moved on. Three years later, in 2019, Brown's book was adapted into a Showtime series of the same name, Murder in the Bayou. Well, what gets me about this is it's undeniable that Big G worked for him. And the witnesses that Ethan Brown talked to said, oh, Charles came here once or twice. He really liked Loretta. They Mm -hmm. hooked up and why he would be there. And that's, that was kind of his, I won't say excuse, but kind of his way of poo pooing. It was this very snobby. I would never denigrate myself by going to a filthy place like Jennings. Well, first of all, you're trying to run to be our Senator. So maybe take a fucking interest in what's going on down Mm -hmm. here. But just the transparency, the utter Fucking transparency 
of filing a defamation lawsuit while the campaign is ongoing so that you can say, this is such a lie, I'm suing for defamation and dropping it before discovery, before Mm -hmm. any information can be dug up on your ass, because truth is an absolute defense. And you don't think Ethan Brown has got fucking receipts? My Mm -hmm. dude has got receipts. He has Showtime behind him. He has, I believe it's Simon & Schuster. It's a a big-ass publisher Mm -hmm. behind him. They're not going to publish something that they have not arduously fact-checked. So the transparency of filing this lawsuit while the Senate campaign was ongoing, it was too fucking late, though. If you watch interviews with this guy at the time he's floundering it's sad as shit because of he got caught Mm red-handed but then to drop the lawsuit and then just be like well i'm just like moved on it's fine so big deal Mm -hmm. it's like you were never to me that's like so bad faith like you were never gonna follow through on that lawsuit because they would have nailed your ass with the facts you'd be in prison right now for sure the murders of the jeff davis eight remain unsolved was the police picking off their informants one by one Or did they get local roustabouts, Frankie Richard and Billy Connor, to do their dirty work? Frankie Richard's daughter, Lauren, told filmmakers of her uncle. Billy knew something. Since his camper was a hot spot for drugs and sex, and he knew every single victim. As for her father, Lauren said, My daddy's smart, but he ain't that smart to where he could cover up evidence. In the way that they do it, it seemed like it was a trained person, somebody who knew how to cover their tracks. But yeah, I feel like my daddy knows more than what he's saying. I do, too, Lauren. It was, a, it was a bizarre interview with her because she's like, oh, first of all, my daddy's smart. Well, he's savvy. I, I will give him that because he survived as long he's as he did. probably street smart. Yeah, but, she, you know, she, she's like, he never told me anything. But I really feel like the people that did this would be somebody with professional training around evidence. It's like, what are you trying to say? Is she, Or was she just, that's really, truly just her opinion. Mm-hmm. And she wasn't trying to point any kind of fingers. Well, with her imagine questions. the life she's had. And her childhood, when you're well, the daughter of this, as you know, local kingpin, I imagine you see stuff, you hear stuff, you are a part of stuff that um, you learn early on. I'm keeping my mouth shut. Yeah. And she said that people knew her dad's reputation, that she and her brother suffered severe bullying because it was kind of like, you know, your dad's a crackhead or your dad is, mm-hmm. you know, uh, a pimp. He's, you know, whatever. And there are there's collateral damage to this. And it's those kids. But like I said, it's this weird. This is the investigation discovery one. This is weird scene where she's just sitting on a porch string going, I think my daddy knows something. Mm-hmm. Dot, dot, dot. All these years later, there's still little closure for the families. Billy Connor died of cancer in 2014, and his camper was removed from the property where it had sat for many years. Warren Gary was murdered by his grandson in his sleep at age 60 in November of 2016. Frankie Richard died on March 22, 2020, at the age of 64. Online records indicate that Ricky Edwards was still with the Louisiana Sheriff's Association, at least as of 2020. Public records show that in July of 2017, Terry Guillory moved to the Welsh Police Department, another town in Jeff Davis Parish. Neither man has ever been charged with anything related to the murders, and both deny any involvement. The task force formed by Sheriff Ricky Edwards disbanded years ago, but local police in Jennings call all the Jeff Davis 8 cases active and claim that they are running down tips. If you have any information, contact the Jefferson Davis Parish Sheriff's Office online at www.jdpso.org slash crime dash tips. To report misconduct by law enforcement, contact the FBI at tips.fbi.gov. So what do we think? Whew. Well, uh, that's kind of the problem when we were coming up with our call to action because we don't like to leave stuff just on... Mm -hmm. Well, that's it, you know, but the problem is the very people to whom you may be reporting a tip may, in fact, be the people responsible. So I think the FBI, I think the Department of Justice that investigates law enforcement agencies absolutely needs to step in, and they have not so far. I agree. I think as far as who was doing the killing, I don't think one person was responsible. I think it's a group of people that are all intertwined and working together. Different people, I think, kill different women, but Mm -hmm. they were all tied to the same circles, the same social circles, the same circle of cops. Time and time again, everything keeps coming back to the same people. As far as 
who killed each woman, we kind of have some some theories of our own based on what the family members and other residents have have said. The first victim, Loretta, she told her family in advance that if anything happened, it was the police. And then she was also seen getting out of Terry's patrol car after being released from jail at uh, her mom's house. And she said, I never got brought home. So I knew that there was some kind of relationship going on. And then, you know, Roxanne sees her having sex with Terry through the bars in the local jail just a few weeks before her murder. And she had said that, you know, she was going to testify against a, a drug dealer. So by all those facts, it seems like Terry had a hand in getting rid of her. Or, you know, you never know if it's whoever she was going to testify found out about yeah. it. Or So, yeah, I mean, some the, he was uh, heavily related to her in the final days of her murder. So it's... Whatever information he knows, I think, should be uh, looked at by a law enforcement mm-hmm. agency that's not under the control of someone local that's, like, related to him or has worked with him since the 80s. There's too much of a conflict of interest for it to be anywhere in around Jennings or even nearby towns. That, like you said, the FBI needs to step in for sure. Yeah, fresh set of eyes. And then Ernestine Daniels, you know, for her part, her parents believe the men that were initially arrested mm-hmm were responsible, uh, Lawrence Nixon and Byron Chad Jones. But, you know, the like I said, the evidence got washed away. They were let out for lack of evidence. Ethan Brown called them hands-on guys for Frankie Richard and, you know, said they were related. So, again, you see coming back to even if Frankie Richard was not the one that killed Ernestine, if she saw something, she was a maid at the Boudreaux Inn, mm-hmm. so did she see something? And then that's why she was targeted uh, that – but for her parents' part, that's they think that the original arrest was correct, but that they were let out for this, again, destroyed evidence. Mm-hmm. And because cops knew that they were working for Frankie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for Chris and Gary Lopez, you know, initially Tracy Chasson came forward and said, well, Frankie got mad at her, and then Hannah held her head under the water. And Frankie Richard's like, well, I think Tracy held the held her, her head under the water, and that's why she she wasn't really making up this story about Hannah. She was confessing in a way, but then just replacing Hannah's name in the story for her own. Uh, Frankie said also that Tracy came back and said, they forced me to do it. They forced me to do it, but didn't say who they was. Um, in the investigation discovery show, Whitney's sister, Brittany, said she thinks it was Frankie that had to do something with Kristen's death. And, you know, that the truck was used in it. You know, she was seen driving around with gentlemen in this truck. And again, it was some hands on men of Frankie Richard. So as much as he was trying to blame Tracy and saying, oh, she must have done it. The general consensus of people involved seemed to be that if it was not Frankie directly, one of some of his hands on men had something to do with mm-hmm. it. Frankie. In all of his interviews, he looks real rough. He's, uh, he's, you know, I, I mean, in the time he was even younger in 64, so he wasn't that old, but he had a rough life of a lot of drugs and, and hard life, and it definitely had taken his toll. So I don't even know if he would be physically able to do all of this to, I mean, maybe kill someone, but to dispose of a body and all of that. He was, he seemed pretty weak. So he, I'm sure he would need help. And kind of always bent over, yeah. frail, breathing heavy. I was thinking that watching it before I looked up, you know, when he passed away. I was like, this man, the fact that he's still alive yeah. is shocking. Yeah. It, with as much drugs as he had done his whole life, it was very surprising. Um, he seems he seems like he's on drugs during the interviews, too. Very much. At one point, he, like, kind of passes out in the middle of one of them. Yeah, and different drugs at different times, because mm-hmm. in some interviews, he's kind of hopped up. In some interviews, he's kind of dazed looking mm-hmm. off. And then other ones, he's, like, very intense and, like, staring straight at the camera. So you're, like, you, just depending on what day you mm-hmm. got him, that was what version you got out of him, too. For sure. Whitney was the fourth victim. She was last seen at Billy Connor and Frankie Richard's place doing drugs and partying. Frankie claims that she didn't stay and that the last time he saw her, she was walking away from his house toward an abandoned house where she was known to stay. But her sisters don't really understand what that would happen. If she was there partying, why would she have left in the middle of it to go somewhere else? They think she died in Billy's camper, possibly at Frankie's hands. And then whoever disposed of, of her body. They uh, also told interviewers with Investigation Discovery that they believe that the man who found Whitney's body, Jamie Trahan, was forced to dispose of it by Frankie Richard. And that was the guy that we talked about last time that they 
was in the truck with his brother-in-law, Chad Richards, and took the wide turn onto the road. And Chad's like, he knew that that body was there and that he needed to avoid it. And then hours later, he calls it in like it's the first time he, he saw it. Yeah, and he they said he felt so bad about it, which they said it was bizarre that he gave him a $1,500 check to try to help pay for Whitney's funeral. And they're like, we are not related. We don't. You guys mm-hmm. weren't, like, dating. Like, why do you want to do that? And they think that it was guilt money. Mm-hmm. But the check he wrote bounced. So, it didn't. you know, the guilt money wasn't, he wasn't good for it. Uh, but, of course, he denied all allegations. They interview him from jail on an unrelated matter on the phone. He's like, no, I didn't. I didn't have anything to do with disposing the body. I didn't do anything like that um you talked about chad richard he was also in rehab with frankie richard at one point and he says that while they were in rehab that frankie admitted to him that he beat whitney to death and then put her body in a 55 gallon drum before having it dumped and he also confessed chad says that frankie also confessed to killing Kristen, but didn't really give him any details but after he was saying all this to chad suddenly the next morning frankie richard was gone out of rehab he doth protest too much. He knew he had said too much. He's getting no, out of like, there, I guess. Said, Y'all got to get me out of here. Yeah, I'm surprised Chad is still with us if he is privy to all that information. Right, stay safe. Muggy Brown, the fifth one, like so many other, had told family members that she was ready to come forward with information to the cops uh, about a, another murder. She was an informant. She was nervous about what this was going to mean for her safety and told people that If anything happened to her, it was the cops that did it. She also told uh, ID that she had seen the body of Loretta in the canal before it was even identified by the fishermen. Yeah, and her family was saying, you know, she let us know that she was willing. She said, I'm going to, like we said earlier, I'm going to come forward. I have this information. I want to tell the truth. And that's when she ended up murdered. And she was also interviewed with the Ernestine Patterson investigation. She was involved with, like you said, everybody was kind of friends or colleagues or acquaintances, mm-hmm. saw each other at Billy's camper, or saw each other at the Boudreaux Inn. And so she was definitely involved in, knew more than I think they wanted, anybody wanted her to yeah. know. Yeah, she was, to them, a liability. Well, and like the other ones, uh, Crystal Zeno, the Benoit, the sixth victim, like we said earlier, she babysat for Terry Guillory. Her cousin thinks that that relationship went beyond babysitter client and was also, you know, frequently partying with Billy and Frankie Richard and Billy Connor's trailer. But the last day she was seen alive, she called Terry Guillory from a payphone at that Phillips 66, got into a white truck with three of the hands on men that are known to kind of be Frankie Richard's henchman and that was the last time she was seen alive and then that was what the person you were talking about earlier who was out in this backwoods area that was a a known area where people would smoke crack Mm -hmm. saw those same three men trudging out of the forest where then Crystal's body would be later found Um, and then that's he came forward with that information saying hey I saw people in that area and that's when he mysteriously died by suicide via train which his family said just absolutely not and that's uh, you know that's as a reminder, Crystal is the one that Terry came to the house and knocked on the door and said, Crystal's dead, but I didn't kill her. But mm-hmm. I know it's her, even though the people that found her thought it could have been a coyote because of the significant amount of decomposition. Mm-hmm. Until they saw the skull, did they realize it was it was a human. One thing in discussing this, too, that sticks out is how incompetent the cops assumed the residents of South Jennings were, that they could say these things to them and it would just smooth it over or, you know, that they were too stupid to put two and two together and realize what was going on. And that's just another gross miscarriage of justice that they are taking advantage of these people that they know are impoverished, that they know struggle with various forms of substance abuse. And they just are like, well, I mean, to them, they're trash. They're expendable. They don't matter. So it's like, Go over and tell them whatever they need to hear so they just shut up and then, you know, whatever. Go about your day. It's just a little blip on the radar to them. Or it's like she saw something. Oh, well, she's, you know, whatever. She's she's a prostitute crackhead. She's not going to whatever. They very much use these like derogatory dehumanizing words. So then later, if it does come to she knows too much, we have to get rid of her. It's like, oh, well, it wasn't a human person with a heart and a soul and a family. It was just these disgusting labels that we threw on and it was kind of a nobody mm-hmm. piece of trash and it's no big deal anyway. So it's almost like, well, they're too stupid to know. So just yeah. do it in front of them. And it, what are they, who are they going to call the cops? That's us. Ha ha ha. ha, ha. ha right. Oh, well, if they are going to go up, then we'll call Frankie. He'll take care yeah, of it. Yeah, exactly. It was a lose-lose situation for everybody involved, which is 
the saddest part of this because you're in this town and you're just screaming for somebody to help and the people that are supposed to help you are the ones that are hurting you. So what do you, what do you do? And I don't have an answer. I mean, I guess none of them do, or they would have done it, you know? Yeah. I mean, a full scale investigation going in, like I said, you needed years ago, the oh, DOJ sure. should have gone in and done something because when it's, it is rampant. The, what gets me, and if I may go on a slight side rant Please. is for all the like bullshit that we want to talk about the war on drugs, or we're doing this, whatever they don't, the authorities, at least the federal authorities, don't seem to give a fuck about all the crack that is running rampant in this very poor community mm-hmm. that if we're out chasing, you know, where the drugs are at, this has been a be- very clear scenario where there is active, organized drug dealing going on that seems to be, by all accounts of folks involved, state-sponsored drug dealing. Mm-hmm. But that one is not, you know, they're not doing the big drug busts on that. It's like, why is if the FBI or DOJ is not going in to at least, you know, take a look at people's civil rights being violated, why would the DEA not care? Because this could be a huge drug bust. You have like one of the hugest drug dealers mm-hmm. in the South that uh, they've got a whole vast organization. Yeah. And after that Dateline episode aired, Ethan Brown said nothing really changed. Mm-mm. They had this huge, you know, expose and then. Okay, everybody was still in office. Everybody was still a cop. Nothing really changed. So if you're a resident and you think, oh, okay, Dateline, NBC's gotten involved. Surely this will do something. And still nothing does. And you're like, well, why isn't the DEA involved? Why isn't the FBI involved? What can I possibly do just living in this town? And I imagine you feel like nothing. What? What? Yeah. To If you want to stay alive, you just keep your mouth shut and grieve and that sucks shit yeah just try to survive Mm -hmm. Brittany was the seventh victim just 17 when she was killed but she was also an informant for the police and she was also known to hang out at the boudreaux inn and had been there from some people said they saw her there the day of her murder and she went to buy the minutes at the gas station at the or at the dollar general and that was the last time anybody saw her alive. She looks really nervous on the oh yeah the video footage of like she's looking around. I believe she even called somebody to come pick her up. Oh, it was called she called Muggy Brown's brother to come pick mm-hmm. her up and he was like, "No, nah, I'm watching a football game." So, she knew some she saw somebody in that parking lot or driving around that she knew meant she was in trouble and was trying to get out of there and unfortunately she didn't. Well, and that footage of the Family Dollar is that is the same parking lot that is across from the Phillips 66, Mm -hmm. which is where we had other victims at. But the footage of her, you really and her mother, who is, I mean, to this day, still Mm -hmm. advocating on her behalf on justice for her. Her mom said, I know my daughter and that she's terrified. Mm -hmm. And you see how she's looking over her shoulder and only being again, you're 17. It's much like when Loretta Shizan was a 14 year old girl getting picked up by the cops. When you know that the, we all call 911 when we're in trouble, except for that may be the person that's Mm -hmm. actually out there waiting for you. So you try to call a friend and you know, it just so happens they don't get you. And then you think, okay, it's only five blocks home. And that's, The last time you're ever seen. Yeah. Brittany also was quoted as saying that Uncle Frankie killed Whitney. So if she knew that and they knew she knew that, again, that's just another target on her back. Crystal, before her murder, had told Brittany, I know who killed Muggy. So then it's almost like whoever started the murders... There were too many other witnesses, and so then they would have to kill that person. Mm-hmm. So then, because Crystal knew who killed Muggy, they had to kill Kristen. And now Brittany knew who killed Whitney. Now they have to kill Brittany. So it starts to spiral out of control. Mm-hmm. And like they're they're now just killing people just by virtue of somebody told them something. And that you know Brittany kind of they said she kind of hollered that on the street. You know, like Uncle Frankie's the one that did it. And it's like, well, who all could have possibly heard it? Yeah. And just by virtue of having knowledge, even if it's like secondhand knowledge, it's enough for whoever is masterminding this or the parties involved to go, go get her from the, to go, go follow her, follow her to the family dollar and go get her and take her home, take her out. And then the final victim, Nicole Guillory, she, much like the others, had told her mom and sister that she had witnessed Loretta Shizon's murder. So again, you have a victim that was a witness for a previous victim. She said she knew who the killer was. She alleged to her family that the police were behind the killings and that, according to the Investigation Discovery Channel, before her death, a tipster called the task force. Again, this is where 
the task force becomes this black hole of tips where they're taking in tips and doing nothing about it. The tipster called the task force and said the next victim would be, quote, and Ethan Brown has like a copy of this uh, this tip where they had typed it out that said the next victim will be, quote, a white female named Nicole, and her name is spelled N-E-C-O-L-E, and that's how it was spelled in the task force report. So either the person calling the tip line knew that it was that Nicole spelled that way or the person typing the tip taking it down knew that her name was Nicole. She also is interviewed extensively by uh, the, this sort of internal investigation around jailhouse sex, inappropriate jailhouse sex by Terry Guillory, other jailers that worked in there trading sex for favors, trading sex for, you know, uh, commissary things, a lighter sentence, just good general good favor. Mm -hmm. And so she's there's footage of her in Murder in the Bayou being very open about, oh, this is all happening. Yeah, that that's they're having sex with us. I'll give you names. I'll tell you names. And so the fact that she was willing to cooperate with this jailhouse sexual abuse task force or you know investigation i wonder if the knowledge that she had having the knowledge that she had it was like oh well nicole's willing like she, she'll yeah. cooperate with somebody so that danger. would make her a target mm-hmm. and there's two other murders that they discuss in murder in the bayou that the families believe are related to this same thing uh one is a, a man mm-hmm. and the other is a um, woman that was a little bit older than the victims but still ran in those same crowds and the families say we believe that they should also be investigated along with the Jeff Davis eight because they knew these girls, they knew the, um, the cops and they knew what everybody was up to. And we think they saw something that they shouldn't have. And then they were taken out because of it. Yeah. The protocols around confidential informants uh, exist for everybody's safety. And it seems like even in, uh, when the other victim, the one you're talking about, the woman that's that we didn't cover her murder, it was several years prior to that. Her family said, you know, she, we know for sure she was a confidential informant, but the cops were like so loose about who they told she was a CI mm. as far as like people she was then giving information on. So her her safety was like constantly in question and of mm-hmm. course the worst case scenario happens so you know whether she was because they found out she was mic'd or because mm-hmm. you know they lured her to a place and then killed her it's like at what point is now law enforcement on the hook for that because you don't follow the protocol surrounding confidential informants because like you said the underlying consensus is oh well they're expendable they're like yeah. just get another one they're just pawns her daughter is interviewed on murder in the bayou and much like loretta she's like they would let her out of the cop car just in the middle of town where and tons of stuff goes on. And then they'd be like, oh, well, nobody was around. And she's like, it takes one person in a dark alleyway that you don't happen to see that sees that. And then it's around that entire town. And then she's dead. Yeah. And then everybody knows. And the other gentleman was working with Terry Guillory as uh, an informant in another Uh, jurisdiction, Mm -hmm. but it was the same. It was still Jeff Davis Parish. It was just another city. And that is a whole other area of corruption that we didn't even touch on that side. But uh, an incident where Terry Guillory told an officer in that area, stop making drug busts. Like, you're costing us money. Stop. And then ends up uh, Terry's story is Stephen pointed a gun at him and Mm -hmm. that he had to fire in order to save his own life. The autopsy report would indicate that there's no way he could have been holding a gun because there were multiple bullet holes in his hands as if he Mm -hmm. was holding them up to defend himself Mm -hmm. or to as a, you know, um, surrendering. Yeah. Um, But yeah, that's a really sad story too, because Terry admittedly is like, Stephen really liked me. You know, he, he, and they would go out and drink and party together. Terry was using and abusing all of these informants, Mm -hmm. both, women and men that he, mm-hmm. that he, you know, and then when he felt threatened and the fun had run out, then he just would take him out. Yeah. It's disturbing when you see a pattern of behavior that is frequently reserved for villains in movies, just the mm-hmm. absolute disregard for the sanctity of human life, the viewing people through this, you know, lens of, disposability and to see that that's not only 
ongoing but remained for decades unchecked and that we only know about the 10 people we've talked about here you know the jeff davis eight and then the the confidential informant and then the two other confidential informants that we can check the the lead the louisiana law enforcement database and see that he's still a police officer Mm -hmm. i think uh you know i'm all here for check like i said certain jobs i'm a lawyer People are doctors. If you're a police officer, I'm sorry. Certain jobs, you got to vet them. You got to vet them. Yeah. Like you said, whether we talk about the Dallas doctor who had decades worth of uh, domestic mm-hmm. violence and uh, outbursts of like random violence who then suddenly becomes violent at work, like that's not shocking, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and we had some uh, listeners saying, well, that's, that's a problem with credentialing. Like, we do, we should have systems in place. And it sounds like he slipped through the cracks. But you see these overarching policy issues where you're like, oh, there's not a central repository for complaints on doctors. So you see this going on. Or there are, but very new, not yet fully fleshed out, central repository for complaints on law enforcement. There's not who's policing the police, you know, who's police. And I'm all for if you're a corrupt lawyer, take your license away. If you're a corrupt doctor, take your license away. If you're a corrupt dentist, take your license away. The same thing goes with cops or teachers or, uh, you know, whatever, a massage therapist. Like we all, if you're a professional who has intimate interaction with the public, especially, especially if you can, you're allowed to carry around what well, you said at the Elton John concert, the cop had a fucking assault rifle. You go, I guess we're just carrying around assault rifles now. That's great. Sure. Serve and protect. However, th- you cannot have unchecked. No, you have to be held power. to a higher accountability. Yeah. That's just part of what comes with the job like that. You just get to. I get to help people stay out of jail or go to jail because I'm a lawyer. That's great. Well, I can't also be a fucking criminal. You know, I get to yeah. put people to sleep in anesthesiology. Yeah, that you can't also be a fucking criminal who randomly shoots dogs. Yeah. So these things, I think we say as a public, why is this not going on? Why don't we have this system of just just keeping it safe? Because also, to me, it impugns the integrity of the entire profession. Mm-hmm. Because newsflash not all cops are as bad as the jennings cops no because this is a severe significant but if this is as severe and significant as this corruption is and it's not checked there's it goes unchecked like you said how many other towns is this imagine, going on in? just imagine how many small towns not even just small towns i mean this goes on in major cities too but i think it's easier to brush things under the rug and keep outsiders out when it is a small town and you just have less to manage. Yeah. Murdoch less people. Style, you know, it's yeah. Like- yeah. And like, and you grow up being known as this, this good old boy and you're indoctrinated mm-hmm. like that and your family is known around town. And so, you know, it's like so many of the cases we've discussed. This is very much one of the birth lottery. Mm-hmm. Some people were born into the South side of Jennings and some people were born into the North and it's a crapshoot on which side you got. Yeah. Unfortunately, we see all too often that only the North Jennings side of people are the ones that are actually, are they being served? I don't particularly think they are as a definition because there are still criminals out on the street knowingly that could just as easily go across those side of the tracks. And they even say in Murder in the Bayou, if these had been some pretty little girls from North Jennings that were going missing, Everybody would have been up in arms. There would have been a manhunt the the first day. But that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. And so that isn't. But just because you've got money and you're rich and you're on the other side of the tracks does not make you immune to this crime. It just makes you ignorant to it because you feel like it can't touch you. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't mean you're safe. You just hadn't crossed the wrong person Mm -hmm. yet. But I think you're right. Well, I think we, we kind of covered all of So what do we think? I do so hope that the there's a larger investigation into yes. what happened here because you can no longer i think it's bungled repeatedly and well I, this made me think of Kristen Smart in that we had repeated bungling and it wasn't until that new sheriff took over in 2011 and took it very seriously and said no we're going to assign cold case investigators we're going to fully fund it i don't care who was involved get me an answer because you do I, to me i'm like you're a new sheriff it absolves you of any liability and that's truly is your job is right like bringing closure getting a monster off the streets and even when a new sheriff because ricky edwards is no longer sheriff of jennings he or sheriff of jeff davis paris he lost that in 2012 that new sheriff kind of ran on like ricky edwards ain't done shit about the jeff davis eight well that guy didn't do shit either Mm -hmm. so you see repeated failures 
And also, if those failures are attributed to more than just gross incompetence, I think that's when it necessitates. And the state has also proven ill-equipped to deal with the corruption for whatever reason. Underfunding, lack of interest, it doesn't matter. But what's horrifying is to know that there are, like, our fellow U.S., you know, we're like, this isn't some faraway place. I mean, this is... One of our listeners texted and said, oh, that's 20 minutes from me. That mm-hmm. place is corrupt as fuck. And it's just like, no, I'm like, don't go over there because yeah. it's it's not good. And like, we're all flag waving Americans. And we want this thing to be right. Like we, you know, you want to have the freedom, whether you live in Jennings or Dallas or Seattle or New York, you deserve to have a system that you could at least kind of trust or maybe think that maybe there's some oversight. And here it's just been unchecked mm-hmm. chaos from 1997 to present. I mean, at least that was when the Dateline thing came out about the asset forfeiture. It's just unchecked. And so in 2020, a uh, civil rights organization, I saw, wrote a letter to the uh, Department of Justice asking for an investigation, but the Department of Justice at the time did not, uh, didn't uh, take didn't take any action that I saw. So maybe that's, it's pending. Maybe they're working on it. Mm-hmm. I don't know, but I hope. terrible. Yeah, it is. And um, hopefully with more, light being shown on this topic that um, these families will see justice for their loved ones. 10 murders and no one to be held accountable is Mm -hmm. hard to wrap your mind around for anybody, but especially if one of those victims was your mom, your sister, your daughter, you it's just a wound that will never heal. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, on a little bit of a lighter note, we have some live shows coming up. We have one this Friday at Dallas Comedy Club at 8.30, Hot Dish. You and I will be in it along with Tommy and several other. um, It's a stacked cast. It's It's going to be a lot of fun. A couple of people I haven't seen in in a minute and haven't played with them in a while. So I'm looking forward to it. Tickets are available at Sinisterhood.com slash live shows. What else is on that same ticket link? In addition to October 27th, so 20 days after our Hot Dish premiere, it's not a premiere, our Hot Dish performance, on October 27th, we're going to be at the Texas Theater, which is an iconic landmark in Texas, and we will be performing a very special, it's our last Sinisterhood live show of the year, and I know what you're saying, you're like, oh, Heather, I'm not in Dallas. Let me just tell you, i got some great news for you. We have figured out a way for you to travel to Dallas instantaneously without ever leaving your home. You could watch it fully nude. You could watch it in the tub. Please do. I hope you do. <laughs> Fully nude, just eating a bucket of greasy chicken. However yes. you want to do it, please do it. We're going to do hashtag nude crew checking in. If you're watching nude, <laughs> we want you to check in during. There's going to be a chat option. I figured it out. I, I believe I figured it out. Someone asked, and yes, we will be able to accept grievances from our digital viewers in advance. So Perfect. we'll put up the link on sinisterhood.com slash contact and you'll be able to submit your grievances in advance for judge christie we'll take some live in the audience grievances and then we'll have if you're watching at home grievances so you got to make sure to go to moment.co slash sinisterhood to get your ticket for our virtual worldwide digital experience it's not just going to be a plain old live stream y'all this is a let me just say it again. It's not a virtual concert. It's a worldwide digital experience. And I'm going to need you to check in, Nude Crew. So <laughs> if you're listening right now and you're like, October 27th, I'm busy. That's crazy. I could never go. Listen, you at any point, you could take your pants off and come to our live show. Because for 10 days after October 27th, the moment is still available. So if you want, you buy your ticket. Sign up. Wait till Halloween, All Hallows Eve. Then strip down. You go to KFC. <laughs> Colonel Sanders is waiting for you. Gets, Wait, go, go, go to spicy. KFC and then strip down. Just That's to true. avoid spending a night in jail on Halloween. <laughs> Unless you have very dark tint on your windows. <laughs> sure. Or but, you say, this is my costume, but I don't think that that will hold up. Food delivery. Say, leave at door. Do not ring there doorbell. You are. Wait till they're gone. Go out and get it. Regardless, sinisterhood.com slash live shows to get. If you're in Dallas, you want to come or moment.co slash sinisterhood. Get on the moment and watch it at any time for 10 days afterwards. So it's like at your leisure. And if you go to the live version, honestly, this is kind of how I am. I would then buy the moment ticket mm-hmm. and watch rewatch it because I get so excited mm-hmm. during stuff I can't always remember. And so this will not be released on our feed like our other live shows. So this is your chance to see it live in Texas. And if you can't see it live or you did see it live, get that moment so that you can relive the fun and the memories, especially if you do something cool like a grievance. That'll be awesome too. Mm-hmm. It's like, I keep love it forever. 
videoing like concerts that we go to and then going back and watching the footage later because you are so like wrapped up in the moment or something but then you get to like feel what it felt like then and kind of relive it and even notice things that you maybe didn't at the time so yeah you'd be like oh yeah so october 27th or 10 days thereafter go to sinisterhood.com slash live shows or moment.co slash sinisterhood and we'll see you hashtag nude crew (laughs) and we're gonna have um a exclusive t-shirt for this show as well that is very cool so that's why you gotta strip down first to prepare yourself for the badass t-shirt yeah and then you put on the t-shirt you can still go pants off though that's okay winnie the poet (laughs) we love providing sinisterhood to you at no cost so if you like what you hear consider supporting the show by donating to our patreon We're a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. And Heather, for our patrons in the Getting Into It and Ruling the Airwaves tier, you get 25% off your moment ticket. How could we have forgotten? You can find that information on our Patreon when you sign up for that tier. We will give you the code and then you can go get 25% off that ticket. You get 25% off and so much more. You get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Rolling the Airwaves and getting into a tier. Last night, I found a Taco Bell meme, and I posted in it, and then I <laughs> forgot that I did it. And this morning, I was like, nice. <laughs> <laughs> you also get a special shout-out on the show, monthly bonus minisode. In September, we did Loab, the AI cryptid. Oof. And uh, we also uploaded all I, – I put Mr. Rogers is out on the internet, and Colonel Sanders is out on the internet. But we saved Dolly Parton, Bigfoot, and several other classic AI artworks – for patrons only and someone said jesus christ i needed a heads up before i opened my patreon app this morning and saw this abomination (laughs) dolly parton bigfoot is something to behold it truly is i want an oil painting version in my home (laughs) it already kind of looks like one somebody was like y'all need to print out the sinisterhood ones because i would buy that as a poster they are very cool looking (laughs) we need to we'll figure out how to make them into posters Done and done. You also get uh, exclusive bonus content like Am I the Asshole, Relationship Advice, Judge Christie, Dear Sinister, True Crime Headlines, and more. And patrons in the Getting Into It tier are able to vote on a bonus content segment each month they would like to see live streamed. This month we had three all new things and y'all voted on Rural Misconnections out of Texas. And uh, check out the Best of Patreon drop in this week because there's a clip of it and then head to Patreon and watch the whole thing because we laughed so (laughs) hard and had such a great time. We did. It was... Who knew that Craigslist was still so alive? Who also knew that we're pronouncing Craigslist wrong? Apparently, everyone that was not from the U.S. was like, you can tell y'all are American because you call it Craigslist and not Craigslist. 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 You also have the fun perk of access to our Discord server, where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We hop on occasionally, and we host monthly Q&As on Crowdcast, where you can ask us all your burning questions. For patrons not in the U.S., you have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of the conversion fee. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available, and those that select this option are rewarded with a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit SinisterHood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. You want to get some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos? Visit Sinisterhood.com and click shop on the top banner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. You can also share any episode by clicking the three dots in the top right corner and share topic-based playlists from Spotify by visiting sinisterhood.com slash playlist. All of this means so much to us and really helps podcasts like us get more exposure. And when you go to sinisterhood.com slash playlists, you can also find our 31 Days of Halloween we did last year. Oh, nice. If you just want a fun, spooky episode every day, and then uh, keep your eyes peeled for the rest of the month. We have another another Halloween-ish mm-hmm. thing for you coming. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod. Like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. We're also on YouTube and TikTok at Sinisterhood Podcast. Christy? I am on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and on TikTok and Twitter at Christy or GTFO. Heather? I'm on Twitter at MCK versus the world and I'm on TikTok and Instagram at Heather versus the world. 
As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey everybody, thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shoutouts. Lady Wilma. Holly Renee. Tammy DeFord. Jessica C. Donna Blackman. Clem Tinsley. Julia Lyman. Penny Meester. Laurel. Lynn. Aaron Soul. Genevieve Greider. Jessica. Shauna Parker. Betsy King. Pine Size Fury. Kinsley. Amy Lady. Caroline Tavardi. Lulu Edmondson. Amy Costello Smith. Leanne Leonard. Nicole W. Missy Rizzy 92. Rhonda Puckett. Rose Maddox. Kirsty Geddes. Amanda Jane. Patricia Gregory. Katie Buxton. Kelsey Atkinson. Elisa. Echo Cockrell Gretz. And Nick. Thank you so much for supporting this show. We could not do this without you. We hope we pronounce your name is correctly. We sincerely appreciate each and every one of you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy. Ha 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 ha.